committee will come to order. Uh, the subcommittee will come to order. Welcome Ranking Member Merkel, members of the subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all of those in attendance. Welcome to the subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia. Hearing on federal benefits, are we meeting expectations? Hearing no objection, the chair, ranking member, and subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Uh, we will begin, I expect that our other distinguished, uh, very distinguished witness will be here momentarily, but uh, we will begin. Uh, Welcome ranking member Marchant, members of the subcommittee, hearing witnesses, and all those in attendance. Much like the federal pay hearing, the subcommittee held on Tuesday, today's hearing to get an overview of insurance and retirement benefits available to federal workers. Future hearings will focus on the existing benefits programs discussed today. However, the federal government must keep current in the types of benefits it offers employees if it is to attract and maintain a quality workforce. The federal government's life and health insurance programs were created in the mid-1950s and the early 1960s. The mid-1980s brought us a new retirement system called FERS, and the late 1990s, early 2000s ushered in paid organ donor leave, long-term care and dental vision insurance. In some cases, the government shares benefit costs. In others, the employee pays all. And while we examine the administration and operation of existing programs, we must begin discussions on future benefit options for our federal employees. Today, I will be circulating a draft legislative proposal to federal employee stakeholders that would provide eight weeks of paid leave for the birth or adoption of a child and four weeks of paid leave for elder care or the serious health condition of a spouse or a child. The proposal would also increase the age from 22 to 25 that young adults can receive health insurance benefits under the FEHBP. I look forward to working with the Office of Personnel Management and employee groups over the recess so this cradle to independence legislation can be introduced in the fall. On March 14th, I introduced H.R. 1518 to allow employees of federally qualified health centers to obtain health coverage under the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. It is my hope that this legislation draws attention to the fact that health centers across this country are finding it more and more difficult to provide affordable health insurance to their own employees. I understand that Representatives Tom Davis and Jim Moran have legislative proposals of their own that will benefit federal employees. I look forward to hearing their recommendations and the recommendations of OPM and the employee groups on how to improve the federal government's benefits program. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Marchant, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for convening this second hearing on the status of the federal employees' pay and benefits. Earlier this week, the subcommittee learned about the federal government's basic pay setting policies, as well as its various policies and practice regarding locality pay, cost of living adjustments, and other compensation and incentives. Today, the subcommittee will hear from personnel experts about the federal employee health and retirement benefits. As I mentioned at Tuesday's hearings, there's a tremendous amount of turnover in the federal workforce today, and these hearings will help the subcommittee get a better sense of what changes, if any, need to be made to the current system. As we discuss the status of the federal employees' pension and health care, I believe we also must be mindful of the financial impact that changes to federal employee benefits could have on the federal budget. I trust the experts will keep this perspective in mind as we discuss any potential changes to improve health and retirement benefits of federal employees. Look forward to hearing from all the witnesses today, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Marchant. Uh, 
Delegate Norton, do you have a statement? Uh, 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 only a brief statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, which, which has to begin with gratitude for you for holding uh, these comprehensive hearings and pay um, last week on benefits, employee and retirement benefits this week. Uh, I don't remember the last time, frankly, that we've had comprehensive hearings on uh, our employee and retirement benefits. Uh, and yet, um, I I what you're, you're doing today could not be more, more timely. You say the expectations, uh, are we meeting expectations? We'd have to ask of whom? The expectation of employees, who after all, most of whom could retire today. Uh, and by the way, uh, most of whom could get top dollar in the private sector. Or do we mean new people? Do we mean people coming out of college? Do we mean expectations of people whom the private si sector is fighting tooth and nail, nail to get? Um, the difference between uh, what is expected of us today and what was expected when I was a kid growing up in this town and a government job was considered a good job, it was considered a good job in no small part because its benefits were superior to the benefits of the private sector at that time to make up for lower pay. Well, now the private sector um, uh, is still for many of the employees of the, of the kind who are now employed today and certainly of the kinds of workers we need uh, to attract, private sector is still a better deal. It's a better deal for wages, it's a better deal for health care, and it's a better deal for benefits. Um, we've had hearings um, in prior years, uh, even when we were in the minority, about the shock waves going through the government with the retirement of the baby boom. We had this artificial uh, windfall of some of the most talented people in the United States who chose to come to government. They came to government in part because of the era in which they grew up. This was the era of the great movements, the era of government service. Uh, but also because there were so many of them that there were enough of them to go around. Well, they produce fewer children, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> and they're not enough to go around now. Not if you mean go around to the private sector, which every day of the week is trying to get the best of them to come, while we, frankly, are doing too little uh, to get those same workers to come. Finally, Mr. Chairman, if I may say so, you and I and a number of, of, of us on this side have, have, uh, have co-sponsored a bill for years now just to raise the retirement benefits from 75 percent uh, of what the employee pays to 80 percent. And we've not gotten the first base on that. Meanwhile, the other side spent <laughs> all the money on tax cuts for the rich and on invading another country, and one wonders if we will get there in time. Uh, if you were to ask me the single most important thing we could do to, to catch up, I think I would focus on health benefits uh, because that's where most Americans feel uh, most dubious today. Health benefits go up so quickly compared uh, to uh, compensation in private and uh, public compensation. Uh, on the other hand, Mr. Chairman, for competitive reasons alone, we need to take an across the board, yes, serious understanding that we don't have the kinds of funds that we should have that should be available to us, but looking across the board as what we will have to do just to be a competitive employer in the 21st century. And looking at it, benefits is a very good place to start. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate Norton. Uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with your, your opening statement and your remarks and simply add that uh, our ability to attract uh, dedicated and, and uh, highly capable employees really will depend on, obviously we can't compete with the private sector in terms of dollar for dollar on salary. And uh, while we deal with many of the same subjects here uh, in the Congress uh, and uh, many of our regulatory agencies deal with the same subject matters, you know, technology, uh, you know, biotech, uh, uh, you know, the FDA, 
different agencies in government, we're, we're on the regulatory side, it still requires us to have highly intelligent folks who are willing to work for this government. And, uh, you know, it, it's uh, frustrating in time when you see how, how much progress industry has made, uh, especially over the last 50 years, the things that we never even dreamed about, and yet we are basically governing, or the government side of things uh, is basically the same, well, we've lost the powdered wigs, that's about it, but we're, we're, we're still operating on a, uh, uh, you know, a 19th century uh, model. And so we, we've got to be able to attract bright, competent, innovative people to help us with the regulatory side of, uh, of government. And we need to be able to attract the best and brightest uh, employees who, uh, who are dedicated. And I think the way we can, we can close the gap in some <coughs> respects, uh, given the fact that we can't compete on a wage basis or a salary basis, is the benefits that we might be able to employ and, uh, and to give to our employees. We could, we could be a, uh, a kinder, gentler government to our workers and uh, encourage them and appreciate them. And that's the way we'll bring people on board because I think there really is a, there really is a goodness in the American people uh, to serve their government. I see it at the VA every day. They're not making as much money, the nurses, uh, the uh, therapists, the docs over at the VA, but they, they take their reward in large part from the good that they're doing for our servicemen. And you can go across every single agency in our government and see people doing the same thing. And uh, we need to reward that, and I, and I think this is a great uh, hearing. It's a great way to, uh, I, I think, address the inequities sometimes uh, of some of our federal employees. I, I am not surprised, Mr. Chairman, that you are the one to bring this to the, to the committee, and uh, I appreciate you doing so, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Lynch. Uh, we will now proceed to our first panel of witness and our distinguished uh, colleague, will be the first witness, the Honorable James Moran, who was elected to his ninth term in the U.S. House of Representatives after a distinguished career of local public policy decision making. He was elected to the House of Representatives. He, is, his, he was elected to his ninth term in 2006. He is a member of the Appropriations Committee where he served on the Defense and Interior Subcommittee and is one of the outstanding leaders in the House of Representatives, Representative Moran. Thank you so much for your kind words, Chairman Davis. It's a pleasure to appear before you, Ranking Member Marchand and, and uh, Congressman Lynch, a good friend. The, uh, uh, I really appreciate your holding this hearing uh, on the retirement benefits available to federal employees. Um, I'm proud to represent more than 40,000 Virginians uh, who uh, serve our country as federal civil servants, as well as 60,000 federal retirees in my district. Protecting the strength and the integrity of the federal workforce and the quality of life of all beneficiar beneficiaries is obviously an appro appropriate priority. Uh, during the past several years, uh, we've worked with the Office of Personnel Management, uh, who is well represented here by its director, Linda Spring, and they, she's been very helpful uh, with us. I want to thank her, uh, as well as the uh, labor organizations who are also represented here today, uh, uh, representing millions of federal employees and retirees. They uh, are NARF as well represented as well. Uh, what we are doing is introducing legislation that will fix an inequity in the current annuity computations within the federal retirement system. About a decade ago, Congress amended the civil service retirement system for workers with part-time service. Some part-time employees were switching to full-time work for their last three years in order to receive their high three annual average salaries. By doing so, they received the same amount of retirement annuity as those who worked their entire career full-time. So they were gaming the retirement system by switching to uh, full-time only at the very end of their careers. Uh, that forced the Congress to create the current methodology for determining part-time retirement benefits. Today, a part-time salary is assigned by its full-time equivalent salary, and then the benefit is prorated 
by the proportion of a full-time career that a part-time employee actually works. The new law is intended to allow an employee to receive a high three salary during a period of part-time service, therefore encouraging part-time service at the end of a career. This often happens when a senior level worker cuts back on his or her hours. The disproportionate share of these workers appears to be women who leave the federal service to care for others in their family. Unfortunately, there are two major problems with the implementation of this new law. First, the law didn't specify that the calculation of full-time equivalent salary would apply to all part-time service before and after the implementation of the law. The result of this omission is that retirement benefits are calculated in two parts. One part based on retirement law for pre-1986 work, and another part based on retirement law for post-1986 work. It also has another adverse consequence. As a result of these two different annuity calculations, there's a financial disincentive for federal employees to take part-time work at the end of their careers. Recruitment, re, retirement annuity calculations are sometimes hundreds of dollars less because employees have taken part-time work during the late stages of their career, which is a problem for us because we're trying to keep these very experienced people who may not want to work full-time, but they will lend their expertise, uh, particularly transitioning to younger employees for various responsibilities. Now, the subcommittee's members' heads are probably spinning over this because it, it's difficult to grasp how these annuity calculations occur. But you can imagine what it's like for a retiree. They're told that there's two different calculations. How much did you work pre-86, post-86? How much was part-time? How much was full-time? It's an overly complex formula that has led to some serious computational errors. Uh, federal retirees, though, are starting to get the picture. Part-time work hurts your retirement. So my legislation will restore full credit for part-time work before 1986 and clarify how the full-time equivalent pay is to be applied. It'll provide a simplified annuity computation in cases involving part-time service for all CSRS employees. In doing so, this proposal will effectively eliminate the adverse effect of part-time service performed late in an employee's career. This change of the law can help stem the wave of retirement the federal government faces imminently. It's been well documented, and this subcommittee knows all too well, that over the next decade, as the baby boom generation nears retirement age, uh, OPM has shown us that we're going to have a crisis in manpower. Approximately 60 percent of the government's 1.6 million white-collar employees and 90 percent of its federal executives will be eligible for retirement over the next decade. Since a leading factor that influences the retention of senior personnel is a worker's retirement package, I'm optimistic that fixing this part-time inequity can provide some help to address this impending worker shortage. Over the past several sessions of Congress, we've submitted this proposal to change the retirement calculation for not only future retirees, but for current retirees that may have suffered a reduction in pension benefits as a result of part-time work. We would have preferred that the legislation uh, that may ultimately gain favor in this subcommittee contain a retroactive component for the current retirees, but I recognize that such a provision would weaken the bill's chances of success. Applying the annuity calculation retroactively could significantly exacerbate the debt that the CSRS retirement fund already faces. Ultimately, that debt will be passed on to the federal em employee retirement system, the FERS system, as the last CSRS employees retire. At some point, Congress is going to have to then either increase taxes or limit benefits. So it's as important as it is to write the inequity of the current part-time calculation, we don't want to add to the burdens of the next generation. Now, I understand that dropping the retroactive provision may lose some support from the federal retirees that are experiencing this retirement inequity, but I, I do think that the only way that this legislation moves forward is with bipartisan cooperation and coordination. The changes that we've offered as an amendment reflect this effort. A perfect bill should not be the downfall of a good one. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member and, and Mrs. Norton and Mr. Lynch, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be heard. You know, in orchestrating this hearing, uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. Tanya Shand, who has uh, reached out to our office. Uh, she's ensured that our questions and concerns are answered in a very professional and timely manner. 
Uh, I do think this proposal will correct a long-standing obstacle to part-time service and help agencies retain qualified federal employees nearing re retirement. So I do ask for your support. It's important, uh, you know, it has the, uh, this legislation could affect up to 600,000 current federal employees, 30% uh, of the federal workforce. Now, of course, that figure decreases over time as CSRS employees move over to FERS. Um, it'll cost about 18 million over a five year period, but it doesn't require any additional appropriations. Uh, they'll be, uh, the funds uh, come to the CSRS financial account through an intergovernmental transfer. So, and of course, FERS is not impacted. Now, uh, I'm more than happy to answer any uh, questions, but I do think it's important to create this parity between FERS and CSRS. Mr. Chairman. That Thank concludes my much. statement. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Moran. Let me just ask you, what has been the, the general reaction both uh, inside the Congress as well as among the employee groups uh, to your proposal? Uh, they are very, uh, very supportive of this proposal because um, uh, the CSRS retirees that take part-time service at the end of their careers are potentially losing hundreds of dollars per month uh, because of this part-time inequity. Uh, you know, over time, it's a, uh, it's a big deal. It really affects their quality of life, and so there is very strong support among all those organizations and individuals uh, represented of the federal workforce and its retirees. Thank you very much. Uh, let me ask Mr. Marchant if he's got. Thank you. The uh, retirees that will be affected uh, by the new plan, there will be certain people that have already retired that this will affect their check. Is it yes. a large number? Um, no. Uh, uh, not really. We're, uh, we're not going retroactively back to so the So every, everybody be held harmless that's already retired that's getting there? That's my understanding. Okay. And um, does the... I expect Keith Bumgarner, who okay. has done my staff work here for me, to tell me if I say anything wrong. Keith, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, good, thanks. <laughs> and uh, as far as the way it, it works now, just functionally, the last three years, is it the amount of time that you work during the day? Is it half time, three quarter time, or is it the amount of pay that sets the, the? It had been the amount of pay, and that's why people were switching uh, to who had worked part time throughout their career, switching to full time for the last three years, and then getting as much as people who had worked full time their entire career. Mm -hmm. That's why the Congress fixed it. But then they had two different calculations, and um, uh, it, it uh, as a res it, it actually uh, penalized people who went to part time. So we're trying to to make it more consistent now, and we do uh, we have a proactive uh, I mean a, a proportionate calculation now that makes it fair and does it the same way they do it in the other retirement systems. Basically, we achieve parity between the two retirement systems. Thank you. Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman Moran, I appreciate you bringing this forward. Uh, I certainly uh, am supportive of the measure, and I realize you've made, some, you've made some compromises here in your own legislation, and I think that's, that's courageous. Uh, and, and I do want to say that from my own experience, even on my own staff, trying to keep people on part-time long enough to train the new employees is critical. Uh, I love, uh, you know, my office manager in Boston just retired recently, and God, I begged her to stay. She worked part-time for quite a while training the new people coming in the door, and uh, she had a wealth of experience having been with Congressman Moakley for about 25 years, and uh, I cried when she left because she was just terrific in bringing in the new people and teaching them the professional standards, and that's happening all across government, and I think you're your bill by, by putting real value on the service, the part-time service of these employees, very experienced, very expertise, uh, 
at the end of their careers will not only allow them to uh, transition slowly into retirement, but also will, will benefit us greatly in training new employees. So I, I'm with you on the bill. Uh, you might have to explain to me again some of the calculations here at another time. I won't do that on the chairman's time, but uh, I appreciate uh, your good work on this, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so much, Mr. Lynch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lynch, and uh, thank you, Representative Moran. We thank appreciate you, you coming, and we appreciate your testimony. Thank you very uh, much. I know that uh, Mr. Davis was not able to get here. Uh, without objection, we will enter his statement into the record, and he will have opportunity to amplify on it should he desire. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. We will now proceed to uh, our second panel. The Honorable Linda Springer, the Honorable Patrick McFarlane, and Mr. Gregory Long. I will proceed with the uh, introduction of our witnesses. The Honorable Linda Springer is the eighth director of the United States Office of Personnel Management. She was unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate in June 2005. As OPM director, Ms. Springer is responsible for the federal government's human resource planning benefit programs, services and policies for the 1.8 million employee civilian workforce worldwide. We thank you again, Ms. Springer. The Honorable Patrick McFarland has been the Inspector General of the Office of Personnel Management since August of 1990. He provides leadership that is independent, nonpartisan, and objective in the pursuit of waste, fraud, and abuse, and mismanagement in programs administered by the OPM. Welcome, Mr. McFarland. Mr. Gregory Long is the director of the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board. Before joining the TSP, Mr. Long spent seven years with City Street, where he served as Director of Marketing for the American Bar Association Retirement Funds. In that position, he oversaw all marketing, sales, and product development activities for a program that provides 401k services to over 4,000 law firms nationwide. Thank you very much, Mr. Long. We appreciate uh, you coming. It is the custom of uh, this committee that all witnesses be sworn. So if you would rise and raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. The record will show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We thank you all for coming. And we will begin, Ms. Springer, with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon uh, to you and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for inviting me back again for the second time this week to discuss, in this case, federal employee benefits. The federal government has long been recognized as a leader in employee sponsored benefits, and that helps us to maintain a competitive advantage both when we're recruiting and retaining top talent to work for our country. The Office of Personnel Management has primary responsibility with respect to these programs and uh, with respect to your topic today, we can report that based on the most recent Federal Human Capital Survey, we are largely meeting expectations with respect to benefits. In a variety of categories, ratings have increased ratings of employee satisfaction. And this has been recognized in the private sector as well. The Gallup Organization has done surveys recently as last fall that indicate that one of the attractors of the workforce to federal employment is our benefit programs. Just to put this, the size of these in perspective, let me comment that we run the world's largest health, single employer sponsored health insurance program. We run a retirement system 
that has nearly three quarters of a trillion dollars in assets, and we've paid out benefits from our major programs totaling about $92 billion, over $91 billion just in one year. So these are major, major programs. The description of our activities with respect to each of these programs is in my written statement, so I will just touch on a few highlights and then spend more time with our legislative uh, uh, initiatives. With respect to retirement, as you've heard, the SERS plan uh, is a, uh, the older of the two plans. There are about 650,000 employees covered by SERS and over 2 million covered by the FERS plans. With the impending retirement wave, it's important that OPM be able to service all of these uh, retirees and new retirees uh, with the most accuracy and timeliness that we can. So as you know, we've been working on a retirement systems modernization project that will transform our processing from a paper-based system that relies on 150,000 file drawers of paper records that could start in this room and end-to-end -end go all the way up I-95 to Baltimore and come back to this room again. So converting from that type of system <coughs> to a cutting-edge state-of-the-art electronic system uh, will help to ensure that we can give federal employees the type of service they deserve when it comes to their retirement. We are on target to roll that out in February of 08, and we appreciate the support, particularly of this subcommittee, in, as we move forward in that effort. Our life insurance program, again, the nation's largest group life insurance program, covers over 4 million federal employees and many of their family members. In fiscal 06, approximately 90,000 claims were paid under our life insurance program and $2.3 billion dispersed. Health insurance benefits. The federal program, again, the largest and single employer sponsored health insurance program in the world. We have over 284 plan choices from approximately 130 private sector plans. We negotiate with each of those uh, programs and to provide those plan choices across the country. They feature the full range of uh, options, HMOs, high deductible plans, fee-for-service plans, and uh, those choices and that commitment to choice is a hallmark of the federal program. One of the very, very important features is the fact that employees are able to carry that coverage into retirement and uh, unlike many of their counterparts in the private sector, they retain the full subsidy. That's something we look at. We look at competitors. And uh, I can tell you that the private sector has backed off in many cases mm. from maintaining that subsidy level from the employer uh, into retirement. But we have continued that. So in effect, we've improved our position by continuing it, whereas other employers have backed away from it. We've done a good job. We believe in maintaining premium rates. And, and uh, last year, or for this year that we're in, 07, those rates only went up by 1.8%, the lowest increase in 11 years. We saw uh, uh, over the past five years rate increases that were lower than the average for the industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some who would say, well, that's because we released reserves. Reserves uh, are determined, the level of re reserve is determined by the insurers, and they are the ones that uh, came to us. It, in effect, that represented an overpayment by employees, and so it's entirely fair to give that back in the way of a smaller premium increase. Uh, we're doing a lot in the way of making medical records uh, ac accessible uh, th uh, to uh, the advanced health information technology that will uh, uh, allow for better care. We've also worked to have our carriers, our health plans, provide information about quality of the providers as well as cost through websites, and that's something we're continuing to do. In 2006, we published new regulations to allow OPM's Office of the Inspector General the right to audit provider contracts, including pres prescription benefits management companies. And I know you're going to be hearing a report from Inspector General McFarland about their success, which has been substantial. And uh, that helps us to maintain a rate of over 99% accuracy in the payment of the federal health plan benefit payments. And we appreciate the work of the Inspector General. Our federal long-term care program uh, was authorized in 2000 by the Congress. 
and we, again, have the largest group insurance program of its type in the country. Last year, as you know, we added dental and vision. We had, uh, we currently have 400,000 enrollments in the dental program and more than 300,000 in vision. And those enrollments are uh, indicative of the interest people have in maintaining good uh, care before bad things happen. By those regular checkups, they're able to forestall things that otherwise might progress to a more serious stage. So it's very important to have participation. The one area that I believe we have a shortcoming in our health program is short-term disability. Uh, people today in our programs have to cobble together a combination of sick leave, other paid leave, donated leave to uh, support uh, times when they were, are too sick or hurt to work for longer periods of time. Uh, that includes maternity. I know there's a great deal of interest by uh, members in dealing with this ad and addressing it, and that's something that we all share. How we come to, what the right answer for that is, is something we look forward to working with you on, but we acknowledge and believe candidly that it is something that needs to be dealt with. Uh, because it's an important uh, area, and, and programs exist. There's no need to have to cobble something together. Our legislative proposal, uh, our most important one that I'll highlight is the part-time reemployment proposal. Uh, I'm happy to hear Mr. Lynch mention the experience he had with retaining the services of a very valued employee. This proposal, along with the one that uh, we've successfully worked on with Congressman Moran, would allow us to address the need for part-time service of our uh, employees. In his case, uh, the one you heard was about keeping people before they retire. In this case, th this would allow us to bring back annuitants without a penalty to them so that they could work, be paid for their work, still get their annuity, which by the way is not double dipping, it's two different streams of service, but would allow us to have their services to train new employees. That's valued service, as Mr. Lynch has indicated. And uh, so that is our major one. There are other uh, improvements that we have suggested and that I'd be happy to answer any questions on. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Director Springer. Uh, Mr. McFarland. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss OPM's Office of the Inspector General's audit and investigative efforts in helping to safeguard the benefits of the federal government employees and retirees from waste, fraud, and abuse. If I may, immediately behind me is Timothy Watkins, who is the, uh, he partnered with HHS OIG in developing the uh, corporate integrity agreement that I will talk about. Uh, to your right, Jill Henderson is the uh, organization's group chief who oversees the audits of the uh, PBMs, and Amy Parker is the special agent on the Medco investigation. The U.S. Office of Personnel Management administers benefits from its trust funds for all federal employees and retirees participating in the civil service retirement system, the federal employees retirement system, federal employees health benefits program, and the federal employees group life insurance program. These programs cover over 8 million current and retired federal civilian employees, including eligible family members, and disperse approximately 91 billion annually from the program trust funds. The majority of our auditing and enforcement activities are spent in protecting these trust funds, particularly the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. Since fiscal year 1997, these activities have produced over 306 million in judicially ordered recoveries and over 1 billion in, recovered, in recommended recoveries through our audits of the participating FEHBP health plans. Today I want to inform you of one of our recently concluded investigations. We participated in an eight-year investigation of Medco Health Solutions Incorporated, Medco, the largest pharmacy benefit manager in the United States. This was a joint investigation with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, as well as the offices of Inspector General at the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense. 
The investigation was initiated after a former Medco employee filed a key TAM lawsuit alleging that Medco defrauded the FEHBP and other health programs. At that time, Medco contacted, contracted with the FEHBP to provide mail order prescription drugs to federal employees, retirees, and their eligible family members insured under the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association Federal Employees Program and other FEHBP plans. The joint investigation concluded that Medco falsely reported their turnaround work performance agreement under the FEHBP carrier contracts. They dispensed prescriptions without properly performing drug utilization reviews that protect the patient. They falsified paper or electronic records relating to the dispensing process. They improperly used pharmacy technicians and other non-pharmacist personnel to perform functions with which legally must be performed by a pharmacist or under a pharmacist's direct supervision. They billed the government for prescriptions that were never filled or ordered. They mailed prescriptions to patients with less than no they mailed prescriptions to patients with less than the number of pills prescribed but charged for the full amount. They made false statements to patients that their mail order prescriptions had not been received when in fact the prescription had been received and then canceled in order to appear to meet contractually required turnaround times. They favored Merck drugs over the other manufacturers' drugs in switching programs, even when the Merck drugs were more expensive. And they made false statements to the United States during the investigation of Medco's illegal conduct. During the investigation, Medco and the United States government agreed to a permanent injunction against several practices. This consent decree, which did not resolve the issue of restitution and monetary damages, was entered into in April of 2004. In October of 2006, the federal government and Medco entered into a settlement agreement to resolve the alleged False Claims Act violations totaling $155 million. Of this amount, $137 million related directly to the FEHBP. The remainder involved other federal programs, including Medicare. As a result of the settlement, the FEHBP Trust Fund received $97 million in restitution. In addition, $40 million in multiple damages associated with the false claims were returned to the U.S. Treasury. This amount represents the largest single, single recovery by our office. Because of the growing importance of drug benefits to the health of FEHBP enrollees and the financial integrity of the trust fund, we pursued additional oversight. Due to the substantial impact Medco and other PBMs could have on the FEHBP, we partnered with the HHS OIG in having Medco sign a corporate integrity agreement referred to as a CIA. The HHS OIG, with our assistance, is monitoring the corporate integrity agreement with Medco. We felt this was the best and most efficient way to protect the FEHBP, in part because the outstanding program the HHS OIG has developed to implement and monitor corporate integrity agreements. This is not the first PBM that our office has investigated for allegedly defrauding the FEHBP. Our office, in, con in coordination with the HS HHS OIG and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, conducted a six-year joint investigation of the PBM Advanced PCS that administered prescription drug benefits for some of the FEHBP plans and Medicare Plus Choice organizations. This case was resolved in September of 2005 with a civil settlement in which Advanced PCS paid $137 million to the federal government. $54 million of this amount was returned to the FEHBP Trust Fund. Mr. Chairman, this statement described a detail of two of our longest and most complex health care fraud cases 
that not only affected the health and well-being of federal employees, retirees, and their families, but also allowed the FEHPP to recover $151 million. We continue to investigate a great number of complex FEHPP healthcare fraud cases and involved billions of dollars. The efforts of our investigators and auditors are critical in preventing waste, fraud, and abuse within OPM programs. For example, results of our past PBM audits have highlighted that much remains to be done to improve oversight and controls regarding PBMs participating in the FEHPP. In this regard, we are working with OPM to identify methods to ensure that the FEHPP derives the safest and best possible pharmaceutical services at a fair price. We feel very strongly that our rigorous ongoing oversight of organizations participating in the FEHPP provides a sentinel effect that helps reduce erroneous and fraudulent payments in the $32 billion a year federal health program. A special note is the positive and cooperative relationship between our office and OPM leadership in pursuit of trust fund integrity. I would be glad to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Mr. McFarland. Uh, Mr. Long. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis, members of the subcommittee. My name is Greg Long. I am the executive director of the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board, and I'm also the managing fiduciary of the Thrift Savings Plan. I welcome this opportunity to uh, summarize my statement. The TSP is a voluntary savings and investment plan that allows federal and postal employees and members of the uniformed services to accumulate savings for their retirement. It currently has approximately 3.8 million individual accounts, and the Thrift Savings Fund has now grown to over 224 billion in assets. Participants may invest in any or all five of the core investment funds and the five life cycle funds. TSP administrative expenses are borne by the participants, not the taxpayers. The FERS participation rate stands at 85.8%. For CSRS employees, it's about 69%. And for the uniformed services, after only five years of availability, now stands at 25.6%. The TSP is administered by the Federal Retirement Thrift Investment Board, which was established as an independent federal agency. There are approximately 70 employees of that agency. With input from the executive director, the statutory employee thrift advisory council, Board staff, the, the five board members establish the policies under which the TSP operates. First, it provides that all monies in the Thrift Savings Fund are held in trust. The executive director and the board members are required to act prudently and solely in the interest of TSP participants and their beneficiaries. This fiduciary responsibility gives the board members and the agency a, a unique status within government. FERSA also requires that the Secretary of Labor mm -hmm to establish a program of fiduciary compliance audits. It mandates that the board contract with a private accounting firm to conduct an annual audit, and it also <laughs> authorizes the 15-member Employee Thrift Advisory Council. The council includes representatives of the major federal and postal unions, other employee organizations, and the uniform services. The agency has always enjoyed an extraordinarily cooperate, cooperative relationship with the Office of Personnel Management. By law, OPM, has statutory responsibility for the overall retirement education of the federal workforce and the training of retirement counselors at federal employing agencies. The board is the entity that ensures the efficient delivery of benefits and services to plan participants. We are located in the executive, in the executive branch but are not part of the administration. The TSP is a participant-directed plan. Each participant decides how to invest the funds in his or her accounts. The TSP funds now include Treasury securities, corporate bonds, the entire U.S. stock market, and stocks of developed countries in Europe, Australia, and the Far East. In August of 2005, the TSP introduced life cycle funds, the L funds, which are invested in various combinations of the five statutory funds. Participants benefit from having professionally designed asset allocation models that are appropriate for their particular investment horizon. We are pleased with the reception of the L funds. As of June, over 515,000 TSP participants have invested more than 21 billion in the L funds. The board contracts with Barclays Global Investors, BGI, to manage the F, the C, the S, and I fund assets. BGI is the largest investment manager of index funds in the United States with al almost $2 trillion in assets under management. 
Although we invite proposals from all qualified providers, only those asset management companies capable of efficiently handling our very large cash flows could satisfy the minimum qualifications required. We know that there are many excellent vendors who would like to perform services for the TSP, but are unable to satisfy the extraordinary demands which an operation of our size requires. In this regard, Mr. Chairman, you and others have expressed interest on behalf of smaller companies. We appreciate that interest and do all that we can to fashion our RFPs to achieve the broadest possible competition consistent with the fiduciary's duty to act solely in the interest of participants. By law, TSP investment policies must provide for both prudent investments and low administrative costs. From the beginning of each fund's existence through December 31 of 06, the G, the F, the C, S, and I funds have provided compound annual returns net of expenses of 6.6%, 7.3%, 11.9%, 10%, and 9% respectively. For calendar year 06, the net plan administrative expenses were 0.03%. What this means is that the 2006 net investment return to participants was reduced by approximately 30 cents for every $1,000 of account balance. These costs compare very favorably with a typical private sector 401k plan. Many improvements made by Congress during the plan's 20-year history have kept pace with the best features of 401k plans offered by private sector employers. However, neither participant expectations nor the Congress stand still. When Congress passed the Pension Protection Act last August, we carefully examined it for potential TSP improvements. The board members recently voted to seek statutory authority to institute automatic enrollment and to make default investments in an age-appropriate L fund. Both of these changes, which private sector plans are encouraged to make under the Pension Protection Act, will improve the TSP. Our own survey of TSP participants, which found that only 3% of respondents were dissatisfied, nevertheless found strong support for these two changes. We hope that the Congress will favorably consider these proposals. The board members further decided at the June meeting to more, ca more carefully examine the possibility of establishing a Roth feature for the TSP and to revisit this issue within two years. The board also continues to pursue administrative program enhancements, including improvements to guard against the constant threat of computer fraud. Earlier this year, we replaced our four-digit PIN number with an eight-character alphanumeric password for the TSP website. Later this year, we will replace our current social security number identifier with a computer-generated account number. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you and the members of the subcommittee for your interest in the TSP and all benefits provided to federal employees. Since coming to the agency last year, I've gained an enormous appreciation for how well mm -hmm. this program meets the needs of employees, and I remain committed to moving forward together with the Congress, the administration, the council, OPM, the employing agencies, and others to continue meet the, to meet the evolving needs of federal employees. That concludes my comments. And I'll Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Long, and uh, we will proceed directly to questions. Um, Director Springer, I'll begin with you. The President's uh, FY208 budget proposed the Blue Cross Blue Shield and the Indemnity Benefit Plan be allowed to offer health savings accounts in the FEHBP. As you know, the federal employee and retiree organizations that will testify later this afternoon are concerned that further expansion of HSAs could increase premiums for a comprehensive plan since relatively healthy enrollees with higher income could be siphoned off into these uh, HSAs. Given the fact that these uh, employee groups have expressed concern, could you tell us why the administration continues to support this proposal since um, relatively few employees have joined the HSAs. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, we do have, as you mentioned, uh, a few options mm -hmm. of that type today, but none are associated with the Blue Cross and Blue Shield system. The, blue, the Blues represent uh, over half of our membership in the federal health plan. So there is a very strong brand identity. So I think that uh, my expectation would be that we would ha see minimal enrollment in 
those types of plans today until it's available through the Blue Cross Blue Shield system because the primary uh, or the first level of decision making is to associate yourself with a brand. Uh, but uh, adding it and uh, allowing that capability for the Blue Cross and Blue Shield system we think is important because we think that a plan of our type, the largest offered in the world by a single employer should have a full range of choice. And we think that only offering it in those very uh, uh, limited circumstances where it's available today doesn't provide that full range of choice. Ultimately, uh, we will deal with the experience, but we think that the population across the system of the blues, all of the three options that would be available will still be substantial in all three. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, OPM, the Inspector General found that Medco Health Solutions engaged in fraud in the FEHBP. However, OPM has decided not to bar Medco from the program. Could you explain? Uh, yes, um, Medco actually has been, is under contract, I believe, or will be by directly with the Blue Cross and Blue Shield, not with us directly. Now, indirectly, that means some services will be provided by them to people who were enrolled in the Blue Cross Blue Shield system, but we have not directly contracted with Medco. Uh, there, uh, I visited with uh, Inspector General McFarlane and I learned that the Blue Cross Blue Shield had engaged in that contract with them uh, because I had the same concern that I think you're expressing. Uh, there are a number of safeguards in place. Uh, the senior management team has changed at Medco. There are a variety of things that uh, I have been told will uh, give them enough comfort that to uh, have engaged in it, uh, that contract, but we will be keeping a very watchful eye on it through the work of the Inspector General. Um, let me ask, what, what changes would you recommend to improve the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program and what concerns do you have, if any, about the effects of increased enrollment and potential adverse selection issues for high deductible health plans and health savings accounts? Uh, well, the first part of your question as far as changes, um, the thing that I really and truly believe that we need to look at at the top of the list is the short-term disability benefit to include maternity. I, I, as I say, that is not a benefit that we provide today. Company, we have found that companies of 200 employees or more, 80% of the time offer a short-term disability insurance program. We do not, and I think it's disgraceful. So uh, that would be my number one issue to attack. The, with respect to the participation issue, again, um, with high deductible plans, I think that there are circumstances where that works and is appropriate. I think there are other people where that's not a good option. And, uh, but I think that it's important to offer it and so that we are state of the art. And uh, a plan like ours should offer the full range of choice. Is it true that employees pay all of the, the disability benefit costs we have not sent a proposal, transmitted a proposal to, uh, to the Congress yet about that. We're still trying to craft the right uh, proposal to send to you. And uh, I know that there's several proposals here, or there's interest, we'd like to work together mm -hmm. with you. Cost, balancing cost with the benefit is obviously a, a concern. And um, uh, one thing we can offer for sure, though, is our negotiating power uh, in getting a good rate, and certainly the tax benefit that uh, comes with a pre-tax uh, uh, contribution of payment, even if it's employee pay off. As a sort of a side uh, question, um, I've introduced legislation to allow community health centers to participate in the uh, FEHBP. Uh, Are you familiar with these centers and I have become familiar with your proposal and uh, learned a little bit about the centers just by reading the testimony that was submitted on it. And as of now, you don't have any uh, concerns about them? 
Well, I, I don't want to speak for the administration. I mean, I think that we would all need to, you know, uh, because it's relative, just come to our attention, we'd have to review that, and, and, and we will do that. Thank you very much, and I will go to uh, Mr. Marchand. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Springer, you stated earlier that the increase in the premium was 1.8 this year, but that is, was a result of a overpayment from the previous year? That was a contributing factor, but not the only factor. There are a number of things that have helped us to control costs uh, in the plan, and, uh, but that was a factor. It would have been higher had that not been mm -hmm. the case. What, what, what would have been the rate of increase without that um, It would have been a little over 6% increase, which still would have been pretty favorable increase. Mm -hmm. um, explain to me the uh, issue about the $3,000 uh, exclude on the health premiums for s public safety officers. I'm going to need a little right help with that, if I may. Okay. And, and I'm happy to okay. have someone. You know what, may, may I have someone get back to you on that, um, Absolutely. Mr. March, and I, yeah. I, I, I don't want to give you an incomplete answer, and I, I need a little help on that. Uh, you've answered the other question, what would your top priority be, and you've answered that uh, with the disability. I answered that, yes, with respect to just the health plan, which I think that was the way that was raised. The, uh, certainly nothing is uh, higher than priority to us than the uh, reemployed annuitant proposal that we have that would allow us to have the benefit of the knowledge and experience of annuitants who want to come back and help train that next generation. Um, I know that there's been overwhelming support for this. Polls show over 80% of employees want it. Uh, uh, the chief human capital officers representing the hiring agencies want it. Uh, the, uh, there, there was a little bit of question about does this, do these people take the place of new employees? Well, when you're facing a shortage of 600,000 potential positions turning over due to retirement, as Congressman Moran said, uh, this is just a drop in the bucket in filling that. The, it's, and it actually helps these new people to come in and learn from the masters and be able to be, uh, and then they go on and the new people are remaining. So. That's that and the short-term disability. And the la last question I'll ask you is, with the um, greater number of veterans that are leaving the service today, and in many instances, the probability of a lot of those uh, injured veterans coming back into the, coming into the federal mm -hmm. workforce, have you, uh, contemplated the, the fact that many of them will be disabled and do you feel like there are uh, an adequate number of jobs that will be available to a disabled uh, vet in the federal system? We, uh, we do believe there will be. Uh, right now veterans make up a quarter, about 450,000 members of the federal workforce. And uh, some agencies obviously have greater participation than others, and we encourage all of them. One of the things we do is highlight veterans' preference and, and work with our agencies. But with respect to disabled veterans particularly, we have uh, established over the past two years programs on site at Walter Reed, at uh, Brook Army Medical Center, and we'll be starting one at Fort Collins, uh, at the three medical uh, facilities there for the armed services to counsel them on jobs in the federal government, uh, on writing resumes, on interviewing. We have people that we staff on site. I've been to Brook Army Medical Center. I've been to the Center for the Intrepid to visit those wounded warriors. They're terrific people and we want them. Le yesterday I just filmed a video to be played uh, for the Navy, I, it was. But uh, we, we want these people. There is a place for them, uh, whether they're disabled or not. Uh, and, and we're very happy to have them. And, and we indicated by our presence on site at the mm -hmm. hospitals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Marchant. Uh, we'll go to Ms. Morton. <coughs> Ms. Springer, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking for um, ways uh, that might be considered more realistic to, to try to uh, encourage the adjustment of, of benefits so that somebody want to come work for the federal government so we'd be competitive. 
Um, even with FEHBP, you have 250,000 or so people who, won't, who don't subscribe to this plan uh, because they can't afford it. Uh, those are people who work for the federal government. And giving up uh, a plan that some of us see as decent because we can't afford it, only because we can't afford it. When's the last, uh, the 72 percent uh, percent that the federal government now pays on average, mm -hmm. when was that percentage set? Uh, I don't know when that was set. Do you know? Yeah, I could get back to I don't know exactly when the 72 percent. Well, I think the reason that you can't think about think of when it was set is it's so long ago. Well, I, I just don't happen to know, that's no, all. No, it's not that you don't happen to know. I didn't expect you to come off the top of your head. Somebody ought to know. I don't know when the FEHVP was, in fact, uh, um, established, but it strikes me that, uh, and I don't know the date myself, mm -hmm. but it strikes me that, that, that the government has rested on its laurels on 72 percent and said, just take that, premiums will go up, uh, and be satisfied with it. Uh, so I'm. You don't intend to recommend any increase in the government share of FEHVP, do you? We do not. That and I, I could tell you why, but we do not. <laughs> that being the case, it's certainly not because you consider it adequate or competitive. We do. With, we employees, do. Of, uh, uh, with employees of the caliber we have, but, but the bell is rung. Is that a bell for us today? Yes. We have well, let me just go on to, let, let me go on. One way to make up for that, it seems to me, would have been uh, for OPM to um, have asked for the subsidy for Medicare Part D, it would have had the effect of reducing the premiums somewhat uh, overall, and of course of helping to keep up with the hugely growing prices of um, of um, drugs in the first place. But the federal government has chosen not to participate. Uh, and therefore to have an effect at least on premiums which, as you have just testified, you do not intend to uh, increase as to the government's portion. Um, don't you think that if you're not going to increase the share, you've got to look at other lower cost ways such as participating, participating in Medicare Part B, D to try to stay, com stay uh, competitive with the kind of private sector employers, the, c the kind of private sector employers who want the same people that we want? You've raised, uh, I think I've heard four questions in there. One are about our participation and the affordability, one about the Medicare subsidy, one about would we raise the subsidy, the 72%, no, and you said you increases wouldn't. In prices. You said you yeah. wouldn't. And I, and I just want to elaborate, for, if I may, a little on that so you have a complete answer. With respect to participation, 85 percent of the people who are eligible do participate. Another 4 percent have spouses in the FEHBP through whom they get their coverage. Another 9 percent get have coverage elsewhere, probably from a prior employer. So there are really only 2 percent who are not covered one way or the other, but 90 percent almost are covered through the FEHBP. So uh, participation is high. Uh, with respect to the competitiveness of the plan, we believe that it is competitive. We believe when we look at other employers, what we see is that they are backing off from their subsidy in many cases. Uh, and so, in effect, that means by us staying at 72 percent, well, uh, uh, we on are On the staying contrary, Ms. Springer, Ms. Springer, uh, that's true. I'm, talk I'm thinking about employers, employees of the kind we need. You have yes. many, many Fortune 500 employees who pay for 100 percent. I, I, I do not know of many who pay 100 percent. I know in uh, the experience we've looked at, that particularly in retirement, that they are uh, decreasing the share of the employer. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about retirement. I mean, that's bad enough. Um, and, and I understand the difference in retirement and, 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 and I understand what we do. I, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about the fact that the, the government, in fact, understood uh, that it wasn't, it wasn't always able, uh, given the level of employee we have, to be competitive in benefits, to be competitive in wages, but it would do things like thrift savings, for example. Which is the kind of thing you think about, well, maybe the pay isn't as good, but there's a thrift savings account. 
or um, again, I'm focusing on health benefits, uh, to name uh, a benefit that if it were in fact changed, this without going from 72% to the 80% that people like me want, might nevertheless have at least a marginal uh, uh, effect, particularly on keeping certain employees who are already here, uh, such, a, such as the, the benefit that uh, some employers have, a gain of the caliber of the federal government that would say a kid doesn't age out at 22, but say ages out at 26. Uh, so that um, one of the most troublesome age groups still remains covered because you're covered by your FEHB pl plan. What I'm trying to get at is if there's not something around the edges, if we keep at uh, increases like, hey, you can have your own vision and dental plan if you pay for it 100%. Hey, how about a long-term plan, which we actually market, uh, even when uh, not all employers will need it. How about a long-term plan if you pay for it? I mean, if, if anything, you are devolving benefits to the point that you can have anything you want to as a group if you pay for it as a group and you've not thought about even around the margins of how you might in fact improve benefits if you can't in fact raise the level of benefits forthrightly. Well, uh, nothing comes without a cost. There's a price tag to all those things and uh, the ultimately the, t the decision will have to be made where we put what is the right level of amount of cost and what is the right place to invest. We do not see, uh, you must be seeing something different than we do, but we do not see that we have, uh, that this is a barrier to retaining or hiring people. People see this in our surveys as a competitive advantage. The satisfaction level with benefits has gone up in our most recent survey compared to the last one. And um, so, you know, I, all I can say is we think that it is still positioned now properly. Ba I, will go, I, I will go, and maybe the, the, I, I just want to say I think this is the most short-sighted notion of your competitive position relative to particularly the kinds of people you're going to have to recruit to become workers in the future. Thank you very much, and we will return. We'll do it. We'll do it. Well, you, you oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you want any water? All those questions. You think so, really? I can hardly remember them. <laughs> I thought he did a great job, too, and he answered all those questions. And me, too. Perfect. My name's Greg. Bill Henderson? <coughs> Amy Clark. Um, in general. 
general with the SEHBP, I don't know that they'll completely hone in on the CBMs, but I yeah. think in general they'll, they'll want to know what, you know, our work has shown. I think there's weaknesses or areas that we see as um, good opportunities for the future. They might need an asshole off the casino to turn down the That would be ideal, yeah. Yep. Hey, uh, this is new for me telling you that.
it is a great thing. A little bit lighter green. Because of the free interactive. Because it's been.
Thank you all very much. The uh, subcommittee will return to order. Um, we'll try and finish up with this panel. Let me thank all of you for continuing to have been here and for being here. We always say that this is the week that we try to get as many things done as we possibly can. And um, everybody's racing, hopefully, for a recess that we still don't know when is going to take place. <laughs> but we suspect that it will be sometime before next week. Um, let me just ask you, uh, Mr. McFarland, Due to the complexity of the pharmacy benefit managers, that is the PBM contracts, what challenges and obstacles have you encountered in performing your audits and what are your recommendations for eliminating these obstacles? Well, Mr. Chairman, um, let me uh, mention five points here and then I will mention what we think we can do to help resolve this. First of all, uh, your point is well taken. Auditing these PBM contracts has proven to be a great challenge. In addition to the normal delays in requesting data from the carriers, we, excuse me, delays in requesting data from the carriers, both PBMs we've audited, Medco and Caremark, were reluctant to provide the claims and administrative data, data necessary to perform the audits. Overall, our PBM audits revealed that the major issue was not contract compliance, but rather the weaknesses found within the contracts themselves. And some of the specifics uh, we've encountered are the five that I mentioned. First, the PBMs contract directly with the insurance carriers and not with OPM. Therefore, OPM has limited control over the terms of these contracts, especially related to pricing and fees. Carriers pay, P Carriers pay PBMs based on a negotiated rate which may have no relationship to the actual price paid for the drugs. Therefore, we cannot determine accurately the amount of profit made on federal business, nor can we determine if the price is fair and reasonable. Contracts are complex, and the specific pricing terms are difficult to understand. OPM should require full disclosure from the PBM regarding pricing terms, including rebates generated from the federal business. Each FEHBP carrier negotiates the terms pricing methods, rebates, administrative fees, etc., of its contract with a PBM. Therefore, there is no consistency among these contracts. And finally, little incentive for the carriers to negotiate the best price for the pharmacy services since OPM reimburses them for all costs charged by the PBMs. Now, as far as the potential solutions, this, I speak in, in the singular, but for the great majority of, of my comments, I'm referring to the cooperative venture with the program office at OPM and our office. And to that end, the first suggestion would be the possibility of uh, changing the language in the Federal uh, Employees Health Benefits Acquisition Regulations to include large providers as subcontractors. Second, to assess the benefits and risks, and I, I emphasize the risks, of carving out pharmacy benefits and having OPM contract directly with the PBMs for these services and benefits. Finally, reimburse PBMs based on the actual cost of the drugs dispensed. Uh, the OIG has identified many areas that require change in the current contract language and or areas that require greater oversight. We are still currently analyzing the contracts and the process of administering pharmacy benefits through the FEHBP. At the conclusion of this process, we will provide our findings and recommendations to OPM 
and work with the appropriate contracting officials to strengthen the controls and oversight regarding the FEHBP's pharmacy benefits. So those are the solutions that we're working toward in concert with OPM. Thank you very much. Let me ask you, Mr. Long, uh, what is the average percent of pay contributed by TSP participants? Has it been going up or down? And how does do the contributions of younger and lower paid employees compare with others in the program? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we did some homework on this uh, a few months back and we prepared a, a report that's available on our website. It's called the Participant Behavior and Demographics Report in which we took a look at activity from 2000 through 2005. And to specifically answer your question, uh, the rate of salary deferral among FERS employees uh, stands at 8.6 percent at the end of 2005. Uh, over the years that has been, over the last five years, I'm very pleased to see that that has been uh, steadily increasing. And uh, specific to to the, the younger and lower paid employees, the challenge there is uh, is first to get them participating in the plan and that then secondly to get them participating in higher rates. Uh, we have seen over the years that participation among most age groups is fairly stable but we have seen some slight increases of participation among the younger and lower paid. We're very pleased to see that. They're contributing at a lower rate than the, the more highly paid and older employees. Uh, they're at about 6.4 percent of pay. And let me ask you, what are your views on adding socially responsible investment funds to the TSP? This is an issue which has uh, received a bit of press lately and it's one that I've uh, been doing uh, a bit of homework on since I uh, joined the board about a year and a half ago. I, I gather that over the years there have been many proposals to uh, divest from uh, or in certain types of securities that are considered bad or over invest in certain types of securities that are considered good. Uh, the congress congressional designers of the TSP 20 years ago uh, clearly came out and said that, that social and political considerations should not be uh, used in the TSP. Certainly we shouldn't be using participant money to further those goals. And that's a position which I agree with and the board agrees with. Uh, what we can't do is there is no particular social or political goal that everybody's going to agree with. So you'd end up with a hodgepodge of multiple different goals and that would really cause significant problems, especially when we work in a uh, passive management index. Uh, our, our funds are designed to cover broad segments. And in, th in this case, you'd be trying to pluck out certain securities that create significant problems as well as cost. And finally, I'd say that the, uh, the promise that was made to TSP participants was that when you invest your money, the, the fiduciaries will invest it only for your best interest without consideration of social or political goals. And that would change the game. Well, thank you all so very much. Um, we again appreciate uh, your patience and your willingness to stay while we go through our machinations, but uh, it's all a part of the process. Thank you indeed. We appreciate it. Thank you. I wonder if we could actually go to panel four. Uh, I know that Miss um, Kelly has to catch a plane, yeah, and if we could the, accommodate uh, her, we'd like to do that. So if we could go to panel four. And while we're exchanging, I'll just go ahead and introduce the panelists. Colleen Kelly is the president of the National Treasury Employees Union, the nation's largest independent federal sector union representing employees in 31 different government agencies. As the union's top elected official, she leads the NTEU's efforts to achieve the dignity and respect federal employees deserve. Ms. Kelly represents the NTEU before federal agencies in the media and testifies before Congress on issues of importance to NTEU members and federal employees. J. David Cox is the National Secretary Treasurer. 
of the American Federation of Government Employees, the AFGE, the nation's largest union representing federal and D.C. government employees. He was elected during the union's 37th convention in August of 2006. Ms. Margaret Baptiste of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, is the first woman to be elected national president of the National Association of Retired Federal Employees and the first spouse of a federal retiree to hold the position. Mrs. Baptiste is the former president of the South Carolina uh, National Association of Retired Federal Employees Federation. Thank you all so much for being here. It is the custom of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you would stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will reflect that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Of course, you know our procedure. Uh, your entire statement will be included into the record. If you would summarize in five minutes, uh, the green clock means that you start. When it begins to get uh, yellow, you're down to one minute. And of course, red means that you are to cease. Um, thank you all very much. And we'll begin with you, Ms. Kelly. Thank you very much, Chairman Davis, Ranking Member Marchant. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about federal employee benefit and retirement programs. The question you ask, are we meeting expectations, is a relevant and an important one for all federal employees. It is difficult to say that we are meeting expectations when every day federal employees are asked to do more with less and face an often hostile administration that does not seem to value the work done by federal employees every day. We appreciate those members of Congress like yourself, Mr. Chairman, who put substantial time and effort into improving working conditions for federal employees. NTEU is actively working on a number of these proposals. First, increasing the coverage for dependents in FEHB to age 25. Thank you very much for your draft legislation, Mr. Chairman. Young adults are the fastest growing age group among the un uninsured. And while the current law does provide health insurance until age 22, 22-year-olds are, are seldom in a position to obtain health insurance themselves. Several states have enacted legislation to avert this health crisis. Because young adults are healthier than older adults, it is possible that adding more of them to a pool of health care participants may even lower the average cost for group insurance. NTU looks forward to working with you to have your proposal enacted into law. Paid parental leave. NTEU has long been an advocate for parental leave and was instrumental in the successful passage of the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993. Since that time, it has become clear that many who would take advantage of time off to care for a baby have not because they were unable to forego their income. A benefit that you cannot take advantage of is not much of a benefit. Most industrialized nations already provide paid family leave. Mr. Chairman, we will do all we can to help enact your draft legislation making this a reality. We have been fortunate in the 110th Congress to have many issues advanced by NTEU that were introduced as legislation, and in most cases with bipartisan support. These include premium conversion to allow federal and military retirees to use pre-tax dollars to pay for their health insurance premiums, recapture credit, allowing individuals who return to the government service after receiving a refund of their retirement contributions to recapture credit for the service covered by that refund, Annuity and part-time service, correcting the glitch in the 1986 law that changed that formula that Congressman Moran spoke to. NTU is supportive of that change, but we are concerned about the elimination of the retroactivity clause, and we will work with this committee and with uh, Mr. Moran on that issue. Pension offset and windfall elimin elimination, changing the Social Security provisions that prevent federal retirees from receiving the full Social Security benefits to which they are entitled. Cost of health insurance, where there has been some discussion today already. NTEU continues to be very concerned about the escalating cost of health insurance for federal employees, and we ask for your help in persuading the Office of Personnel Management to pursue two items that could lower health benefit premiums for federal workers. First, which was talked about earlier, the Medicare drug subsidy. 
If OPM had applied for the drug subsidy to which it is entitled under Medicare, it would have lowered the average 2006 FEHB premium by 2.6%. We need a legislative measure to require OPM to apply for that subsidy. Second, negotiating the drug prices. OPM negotiates with carriers for the best overall health care package, but the carriers negotiate for the best drug prices. We would like to see OPM negotiate for the drug prices to try to bring those costs down. In addition, we are working to achieve passage of H.R. 1256, introduced by Congressman Hoyer and Wolf, which would increase the level of government contributions under FEHB from 72 percent to 80 percent. Federal employees are paying a constantly increasing share of their paycheck for health insurance premiums for their families, often at the same time watching their coverage decline. Since 2001, FEHB premiums have risen by 50 percent. Had the OPM not dipped into the reserve funds for the current year, federal participants would have realized increases, as we heard from Director Springer, of over 6 percent. Making FEHB premiums more affordable is a priority for NTEU. Finally, Mr. Chairman, in regard to the Federal Retirement Thrift Savings Plan, Congress established TSP investment policy by passing the Federal Employees Retirement System Act, which wisely left the management of the fund to the Thrift Investment Board, the only group that has a fiduciary responsibility to the fund's investors. They take it seriously, and that fund is a great success. We believe that they should take the lead in deciding on new investments in the future. Thank you very much, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, and we'll go to Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. Federal employee benefits need to be considered in the context of overall compensation. The shortcomings in federal salaries make it increasingly difficult for federal employees to afford the cost of fully participating in all the benefit programs made available to them through OPM. The list of benefits available to federal employees sounds impressive. The new list of new benefits sounds pretty impressive, too, until you realize the new benefits are all employee pays all. But this approach is just a, the logical conclusion of the attitude OPM currently has towards all federal employee benefits. This attitude is that benefits should be made available to federal employees for purchase. That is, they should not be paid for by the employer. They, should th they seem to think that at most the employer should negotiate a group discount. This has been the case with long-term care insurance as well as the newest benefits for vision and dental insurance. AFG strongly opposes OPM's approach. Until major national health care reform is enacted, we believe that it's our employer's responsibility to finance coverage generously enough so that every federal employee and retiree and all their dependents have comprehensive and affordable coverage. This means financing at the rate of at least 80 percent so that even the lowest graded federal employees can afford coverage for themselves and their families. We also believe that dental and vision coverage are fundamental components of health care and it is a disgrace that federal government has carved out these two categories of coverage into separate employee pays all plans. Comprehensive dental and vision belong in a standard benefits package that should be required offering in the federal employee health benefit program and should be subsidized at the same rate as other health care services. In 2000, OPM initiated long-term care insurance as the first employee pays all benefit or pseudo benefit. Then came the Bush administration and this time the employee pays all insurance idea was applied to health care benefits previously considered part of a comprehensive package and subsidized at the same rate as other health care services. Although the plans that provide vision and dental benefits have not yet dropped this coverage, enrollees are bracing for this eventuality as coverage of these services is not included in the statutory requirements for benefits. AFGE opposes the carve out of dental and vision coverage in the strongest possible terms. Both dental and vision care are fundamental to good health and to the ability to function in any work environment. Earlier this year, we became aware of not only a tragic consequence that happened of access, lack of access to dental care, but also how closely dental illness is linked to other illnesses. In March, a 12-year-old boy from Prince George's County, Maryland, 
died from an infection that started in an abscessed tooth. The infection spread to the boy's brain, and for the want of dental care, a completely preventable death was not prevented. Corrected vision and healthy gums are not cosmetic electives. This is not about tinted contact lenses or bleached teeth. This is about health care. AFG urges Congress to add language to Chapter 89 of Title V to make vision and dental coverage mandatory categories for the federal employee health benefit plans. OPM has carried out the Bush administration's health care policy by shifting costs to enrollees and trying to persuade them to replace traditional insurance with health savings accounts. In addition, the administration has each year included in its budget proposals policies that would require employees to pay more or receive less. Worse, it has promoted carving out benefits currently subsidized by the government and offering them on an employee pays all basis. None of these policies is consistent with an effort to recruit the next generation of federal employees or to maintain morale and commitment among those on board. AFG urges Congress to resist the administration's efforts to undo a generation's progress and establish the federal government as a fair employer and provide decent benefits sufficient to provide economic security to its employees and retirees. This concludes my statement. I would be glad to take any questions, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. Uh, Ms. Baptiste. Mr. Chairman, I'm Baptiste. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I am pleased to present NAF's views on the federal retirement benefit programs, which are so crucial to the economic and health care security of our federal employee, retiree, and survivor members. Our primary legislative objective is to preserve the retirement and insurance benefits we earn as part of the total compensation packages of careers in federal service. Clearly, it is essential the federal service attract and retain the highest caliber of employees as new challenges put new pressures on the federal budget. But it also is imperative that the federal government continue to honor its commitments to its workers and retirees. Among those commitments is the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, a program cited by many policy experts as a model group health insurance plan and I cannot pass up this opportunity to thank Congressman Tom Davis and the majority of the members of this subcommittee for the introduction and support of H.R. 1110, the NAF-backed bill to extend to retirees the tax benefit of premium conversion, which executive and legislative branch employees have had for several years. This clarification of the tax code would be a modest step in making annuitants FEHB premiums more affordable. I hope that by working together, we could move this legislation out of the Ways and Means Committee towards enactment in this Congress. The Office of Personnel Management does a good job of negotiating premiums for the FEHBP, but we are concerned that a $1 billion payment which could be used to lower costs is left on the table. The 2003 Medicare law provided all employees, including employers including the government, a subsidy if they provide drug coverage as generous as Medicare. Unfortunately, the administration has decided to forgo this payment on behalf of FEHBP enrollees. A recent GAO report found the premium growth in one of the largest FEHBP plans with many older enrollees could have been 3.5 to 4% lower in 2006 had the payment been accessed. And it could have reduced overall FEHBP premiums for the year by more than 2%. We cannot understand why the administration failed to apply for this subsidy to which they did not originally object. In addition, NAF is concerned that offering health savings accounts could undermine the FEHBP. GAO data has strengthened our belief that healthier, wealthier enrollees tend to be attracted to HSAs because as low health care users, they can be rewarded with unspent balances at the end of each year. Less healthy enrollees avoid them and are more likely to stay in traditional comprehensive plans forcing these plans to raise premiums, cut benefits, or both. 
So far, HSAs have had minimal effect on comprehensive plans because few have joined them. The administration's 2008 budget could jumpstart enrollment in HSAs if Blue Cross Blue Shield is allowed to offer them in the FEHBP. Their brand loyalty and marketing resources could significantly increase HSA enrollment if they offered such an option in the FEHBP. And if an additional indemnity HSA also should be added, as the administration has suggested. NARF opposes any further expansion of HSAs. HSAs are a solution in search of a problem. Prescription drugs, the greatest cost driver in FEHBP, are a problem in search of a solution. FEHBP plans should be allowed to buy prescription drugs for enrollees at the discounts provided through the federal supply schedule. This was considered as a pilot project, but the pharmaceutical industry refused to participate. New congressional support for allowing Medicare to directly negotiate drug prices makes it time to revisit this proposal. Retirement income security is a critical part of our compensation package, and an integral part of retirement income planning is the option to elect a survivor annuity. Survivor annuities go a long way in providing peace of mind to the loved ones of federal retirees. I know because I am a survivor annuitant. When my husband elected a survivor annuity, the most he could provide was 55% in exchange for an 8.5% reduction in his own retirement. Knopf believes the federal employees should be able to elect a higher survivor amount if they pay the additional actuarial cost. To make this a reality, we ask you to support a budget-neutral proposal allowing retiring employees to elect additional amounts in 5% increments up to a maximum 75%. Unfortunately, certain CSRS retirees who work part-time toward the end of their careers do not receive the full amount of the annuity they earned because of the application of a 1986 law. Current interpretation discourages many from working part-time at the end of their careers and can result in annuities being reduced by 20%. President Bush's 2008 budget proposed using full-time equivalent salary to calculate the annuities of future retirees who work part-time, but current retirees are left out of this plan. For that reason, NARP had supported Representative Jim Moran's bill, H.R. 2780, but we were disappointed to hear from him today that retirees will be excluded from the part-time remedy in his amended bill. On the other hand, we are pleased that retirees are being sought by agencies who want to rehire them. We believe retirees interested in returning to government service should receive the full salary of the job without any offset of their annuity. NARF supports OPM's proposal to allow agencies to re-employ federal retirees on a limited part-time basis without this offset. Mr. Chairman, we are pleased with the performance of the Federal Thrift Savings Plan and its management. We support a proposal to allow federal workers to contribute bonuses into their TSP accounts and are pleased OPM also supports this. Thank you for your support of federal employee benefits and retirement programs as an investment in the federal government's most valuable asset, its human capital. We stand ready to work with you and the administration to ensure that our retirement programs remain competitive, innovative, and a model for others. Thank you. Thank you very much. and. Um Mr. Marchant, I'll go to you first if you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I'm on a learning curve I've, uh, on this subject, so uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, I come from a Texas system. I spent 18 years in the Texas legislature and actually served on the pensions board and the pensions committee. So I'm still trying to digest and understand the federal system. Uh, we we did, do have a 25-year-old 25 uh, 25 
uh, provision in our insurance, and that's why I'm not on federal insurance. I'm on, I'm a retiree from Texas, and I'm, my family and I are still on the Texas uh, insurance as a retiree, mainly because I've got two kids under the age of 25. So uh, have you been able to get an actuarial um, study done on the actual, um, I, I know that when the kids go out at age 22 and three, that their insurance is cheaper. Have you been able to, to get some kind of a study or anything in your hands that will show that, it, that there might even be a, 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 limp, a, a premium lowering? Actually, I'm aware of a study that OPM did, but I, I would call it kind of a back of the envelope calculations. I, it was a three page report and I think would be very helpful and beneficial if there were a better look taken, a closer look to see what, um, what the actual numbers would be and also to make sure that all of the you know, costs and benefits are considered in the calculation. Yeah. I do not think that has been done to date. Yeah, it may be a, a missed opportunity to, to broaden the, the pool and, and bring the premium, at least stabilize the premium. I agree. Um, the other aspect of it is, and we have a, we, uh, I have opted to, to do a uh, uh, deferred, uh, retirement so that if I pass away my wife does the retire gets the retirement and ours is a but ours is a substantial decrease it's about a 30 to 40 percent decrease with a hundred percent replacement so I'm mr. chairman I'm wide open to that idea I, I think that we should explore it and I think it should be the prerogative of the retiree again it, it have to be actuarially sound, but uh, I do know that states are states that are funding their benefit out of a independent pool and not out of the the budget, the operating budget, are bring, are doing that, and it's actuarially sound. So I would I would be a proponent of that. Um, those are the two thoughts I have, Mr. Chairman. Well, Thanks thank for your testimony. Does yeah. indeed. Let me ask um, each one of you: uh, Do you have any recommendations, or how would you improve the prescription drug benefit in in the FDHCP? Well, in my testimony, I and actually a number of us have mentioned the um, the drug subsidy. I mean, from a cost perspective, that is the complaint that I hear all the time uh, from enrollees in the plan. And there just seems to be such a missed opportunity here that I don't understand why OPM has not taken advantage of, um, you know, with the uh, opportunity with the Medicare subsidy. And you know, I would hope they would just take it because it's the right thing to do. But absent that, uh, again, I would hope that some legislation is passed that directs them to do it and requires them to do it. It's, um, it's costing federal employees money that, uh, that they shouldn't have to pay. Mr. Chairman, as I shared with you, I worked for the Veterans Administration for 23 years. I believe AFGE has raised the issue on numerous occasions. Why can't federal employees, their health insurance, bargain with the VA, and those other entities that go out to the drug manufacturers and try to get the better prices. So I mean, a VA does very well with its drug buying, and I believe if you put that pool of several million federal employees and retirees in that, that you certainly would have a much larger buying power and could certainly have a cost savings with that. Ms. Baptiste. Well, as I said in my statement, Mr. Chairman, we believe strongly that the subsidy should have been taken, and I agree with Ms. Kelly on that. And we also believe that the FEHBP plan should be allowed to buy prescription drugs at the discounts provided through the federal supply, supply schedule. How important um, would you say that uh, vision and dental coverage is? Um, that's something that um, 
both of those, I think, have always been stepchildren, quite frankly, of health care delivery. And we've never reached a point where dental vision or mental health services have had the kind of attention that I think they've needed. But just the dental vision, how important do you think that? Mr. Chairman, I would not be able to see you without my glasses on. I would not be able to read this paper. Vision is very, very important to all of us. Think what it would like to not be able to see. Dental, again, that's part of a healthy person preventing uh, your teeth or in your head that's next to your brain. You do not want infections in your teeth. Uh, it's a shame that the federal government has not, again, with the many federal employees and the retirees, had a program that required all of the participants in the federal employee health benefit plan, all the companies, to offer dental and vision and to cover, like at 80 percent, to do that for them. That's how you have healthy people. It will save money in the long run because you keep people well and you prevent things. Uh, I think of this 12-year-old boy, that's a, a tragedy that should have never occurred in a country as great as this. I think the, uh, the numbers of enrollment for the first year in the vision and dental speak volumes to how important this is. Even with employees having to pay 100 percent of the cost, there were 700,000 federal employees who signed up when it was first made available. NTEU supported the um, introduction of a vision and dental plan for federal employees, but we had also supported that it be done with some government contribution. Even if starting out it wasn't the full FEHB contribution, some contribution. And we had hoped right up till the last minute that that would happen. Even in the end, when, the, when it was clear there would be no contribution by the government, NTU still supported these plans because we believed that they were important to federal employees and that they would be taken advantage of. And like I said, I think um, for a first year enrollment that those numbers were, uh, they were higher than I expected. But uh, they would have been much, much higher had there been a, any kind of a uh, contribution by the government so that others who could not afford to pay the whole premium could do so. Ms. Baptiste, you have any comment? I agree with Ms. Kelly. If these were both, um, it would put up the cost of enrollment a very considerable amount. But teeth and vision are important, and if it's a sub subject that needs working on. Let me ask each of you. Ms. Kelly, are you familiar with community health centers? I am not, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cox, are you familiar with? No, sir. Ms. Baptiste, are you familiar with community health centers? No. Well, let me thank you all so very much in terms of, um, again, your patience and willingness to be here and to share your testimony with us, and we appreciate it. Thank, thank you very you, much. Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, Mr. Chairman. In some arrangements, the first shall be last, and um, the last shall be first. But in this one, we'll say that the third shall be last. While our panel is assembling, uh, let me just uh, introduce them. Uh, our panel consists of Ms. Hinda Chalkine. Ms. Hinda Chalkine is a specialist in healthcare financing at the Congressional Research Service, CRS, covering federal employee health benefits, Medicare Advantage, Medicare reform, Medicare spending, retiree health insurance, and other private health insurance issues. Prior to joining CRS, she was with the Department of Health and Human Services in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Management and Budget 
responsible for budgetary, legislative, and regulatory activity in the Medicare program. Thank you so very much for being with us. Mr. Patrick uh, Purcell is a specialist in income security at the Congressional Research Service. He specializes in policy issues related to the civil service retirement system, the federal employees retirement system, the thrift savings plan, individual retirement accounts, and 401k plans. He has previously worked at the Urban Institute, the Congressional Budget Office, and the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you all both for being here. And it's our custom to swear in witnesses, so if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. The record will show that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Of course, each of you know the drill with this, and so if you would um, summarize your statement, we'll put the whole statement in the record, of course, and then we'll have some questions after five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is Hinda Chaikin, and I am a specialist in healthcare financing with the Congressional Research Service. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today about the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program and the Federal Employees Dental and Vision Insurance Program. The Federal Employees Health Benefits FEEB Program covers about 8 million current full-time and part-time workers, members of Congress, annuitants, and their families. Eligible family members include a spouse, unmarried dependent children under the age of 22, and continued coverage for qualified disabled children 22 years and older. As Director Springer stated, in total there are about 300 different plan choices, including nationally available fee-for-service plans, locally available plans, such as HMOs, as well as choices offered by plans for standard option, high option, and since 2003, high deductible health insurance plan options combined with a tax advantaged account. Beneficiaries can use their tax advantage accounts to cover qualified medical expenses. As a practical matter, depending on where an enrollee resides, his or her choice of plans is limited to about five to 15 plans. Also, since July 2003, FEEB eligible active employees can place their own pre-tax wages into a healthcare flexible spending account to cover qualified medical expenses. Participation in FEEB is voluntary and enrollees may change plans during designated annual open season periods. Special enrollment periods are also allowed for new employees and for those with a qualifying special circumstance, such as marriage. Pre-existing condition exclusions are not allowed. The government share of premiums is set at 72% of the weighted average premium of all plans in the program, not to exceed 75% of any given plan's premium. It's calculated separately for self only and for family coverage. Part-time workers pay a larger share of their premiums depending on the number of hours that they work. Annuitants and active employees pay the same premium amounts, although active employees have the option of paying premiums on a pre-tax basis. Premiums in 2007 compared to the prior year remain the same for about 63% of enrollees and another 15% of enrollees had a premium increase of less than 5%. That said, while these overall increases are small, some plans did have large increases. Although there's no core standard benefit package required for fee plans, OPM may prescribe reasonable minimum standards for health benefits. All plans cover broad categories of services, including basic hospital, surgical, physician, and emergency care. Plans are required to cover certain special benefits, including prescription drugs, mental health care with parity of coverage for mental health and general medical care coverage, child immunizations, and limits on an enrollee's total out-of-pocket costs for the year. Plans must also include certain cost containment provisions, such as offering a preferred provider organization network in a fee-for-service plan. Despite the wide range of plan choices, more than one half of all individuals enrolled in a fee plan choose one of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, and even those enrolled in other plans tend to remain in their plan from year to year. Comparing the access and employer contributions for the benefits of federal workers to those offered in the private sector provides some insight into how these benefits measure up. 
According to the Department of Labor's March 2006 National Compensation Survey, 71% of private sector workers had access to health benefit plans and 67% had access to prescription drug, prescription drug coverage. Access to health insurance in the private sector increases for firms with more than 100 workers, those who employ white collar workers, full time workers, union workers, and those with average wages of $15 per hour or higher. Private sector employers contributed an average of 82% of the health insurance premium for self only coverage and an average of 70% of the premium for family coverage. On average, 46% of private sector employees had access to dental care and 29% had access to vision care. As required by statute, OPM created the Federal Employees Dental and Vision Insurance Program, FEDVIP, available since December 2006. Employees who are eligible to enroll in a fee program, whether or not they're actually enrolled, may also enroll in FEDVIP. Enrollees are responsible for 100% of the FEDVIP premium. There are three nationally available vision plans, four nationally available dental plans, and another three dental plans that are only available regionally. FEDRIP enrollment occurs during annual open season as well as special election periods, and individuals may choose a self-only, self-plus one, or a family plan. This set of options differs from the fee plans, which allows for two choices, self-only or a family plan. Premiums vary by plan, by whether enrollment includes other family members and residency. Unlike the fee plans, individuals enrolled in a nationwide FEDVIP plan, dental plan, pay different premiums depending on where they live. Active employees must pay FEDVIP premiums on a pre-tax basis. While there are no pre-existing condition exclusions for this coverage, there are waiting periods for orthodontia and switching to a new plan may require a new waiting period. Finally, turning to current issues, Congress is considering legislation that encompasses a wide range of changes to the fee program, including but not limited to allowing federal civilian and military retirees to pay health insurance premiums on a pre-tax basis, expanding the program to cover individuals who are not federal employees, such as employees of small private businesses, or as the chairman has mentioned, employees of federally qualified health centers, expanding required benefits to include additional services, such as hearing aids, increasing the level of government contributions, eliminating the time li limit on the continuation coverage for employees who leave federal service, and requiring plans to establish and maintain el electronic individual personal health records. Other issues facing the program include maintaining the integrity of the risk pool, eliminating fraud and abuse, <coughs> and containing costs. This concludes my statement. I would be happy to answer any questions that the members of the subcommittee might have. And Mr. Persbell. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Marchant, thank you for inviting me to speak with you today about the Federal Employees Retirement System. Federal employees are eligible for retirement benefits under either the Civil Service Retirement System, CSRS, or the Federal Employees Retirement System, FERS. Employees hired in 1984 or later are covered by FERS. Employees hired before that date are covered by CSRS unless they switch to FERS in open seasons held in 1987 and 1998. Today, about three-fourths of federal employees are covered by FERS. This figure rises each year as employees under the old CSRS retire. FERS was established by the Federal Employees Retirement System Act of 1986, and it consists of three elements, Social Security, a defined benefit pension called the FERS Basic Annuity, and the Thrift Savings Plan. Before 1984, federal employees were not covered by Social Security. They were covered instead by the CSRS, which Congress created in 1920. Because Social Security needed greater cash contributions to remain solvent, in 1983, Congress required Social Security coverage for all new federal employees hired in 1984 or later. Congress recognized that Social Security provided some of the same benefits as CSRS, and that covering workers under both plans would require payroll deductions of more than 13 percent of pay. Therefore, Congress directed the development of a new retirement system with Social Security as the base, but also including a defined benefit pension and a savings plan. The result of this was the FERS Act of 1986. Federal employees are fully vested in the FERS basic annuity after five years of service. The minimum retirement age, which was 55 for workers bef born before 1948, will increase over time to 57 for workers born in 1970 or later. 
This year, a worker with 30 years of service can retire at age 55 in 10 months. Workers with 20 to 29 years of service can retire at 60, and workers with 5 to 19 years of service can retire at 62. The FERS basic annuity pays a pension equal to 1% of the average of the three highest <coughs> consecutive years of pay. So for a worker retiring at 55 with 30 years of service, this annuity is equal to 30% of his or her high three pay. FERS also pays a supplement until age 62, which is equal to the amount of the Social Security benefit that the worker earned while employed by the federal government. The supplement ends at 62 regardless of whether the employee applies for Social Security at that age. The legislative history of the FERS Act shows that Congress wished to enroll new employees in Social Security to provide a benefit that in total was comparable to that under CSRS and to make the FERS plan similar to the uh, retirement plans of large employers in the private sector. Thus, in establish establishing the FERS, Congress provided federal employees the opportunity to save for retirement on a tax-deferred basis through the Thrift Savings Plan, or TSP. The Thrift Plan is similar to 401k plans provided by many companies in the private sector. This year, employees under age 50 can contribute up to $15,500 to the TSP. Employees 50 and older can contribute an additional $5,000. These contributions are pre-tax, and investment earnings grow tax-free until the money is withdrawn. The government contributes an amount equal to 1% of pay to the TSP for all employees. In addition, employees covered by FERS receive a 100% match on the first 3% of pay they contribute and a 50% match on the next 2% contributed for a total employer contribution of 5% of pay. Currently, 86% of employees covered by the FERS contribute to the TSP, and the Thrift Board has submitted a bill to Congress to make enrollment in the TSP automatic for new federal employees. The pension benefits provided to federal employees compare favorably to those provided in the private sector. Under FERS, employees participate in Social Security. They are covered by a defined benefit pension and they can save pre-tax through the TSP. This combination of benefits has become rare in the private sector. The Department of Labor reports that only 51% of workers in the private sector participated in an employer-sponsored retirement plan of any kind in 2006, and just 20% of private sector workers were covered by defined benefit plans that provide a guaranteed retirement income. The Labor Department uh, estimates that only 12% of private sector workers participated in both a defined benefit plan and a 401k plan in 2006. This concludes my statement, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you both very much. Um, Ms. Chunkin, let me try to make sure that um, I understand the comparison between um, what federal employees basically qualify for in terms of health benefits and those in the private sector. It seems to me that you're saying that basically federal employees compare rather favorably That's right. to what uh, they could expect in the private sector. In terms of access to plans, yes. I mean, that's all that we were talking, all I was talking about here was access to plans. Mm -hmm. And all federal workers who are contributing either full-time or part-time do have access to a health benefit plan. In the private sector, that access varies. And as I said, it increases as firm size increases, as pay increases, as full-time increases. So there are more uh, barriers, I would say, in the private sector for any given individual to have access to health insurance than there are in the federal workforce. Do you have any um, value comparisons in terms of the value of what they qualify for? I don't have that, but I think that's something that I could get back to you with. Regards I, to. I would appreciate it. Um, Mr. 
Purcell, your testimony suggests that when it comes to retiree benefits, that um, federal employees similarly compare rather favorably to what exists in the private sector. Is that accurate? I think that's an accurate uh, characterization. And the, the reason for that is that in the private sector, since the early 80s, there's been um, a strong trend away from the traditional defined benefit pension um, in favor of the 401k plan. What that means is, I if you looked at the statistics in 1980, you would have seen about the same percentage of workers in the private sector in a plan as are in a plan today, about half. But in 1980, virtually all of them would have been in a traditional pension. Um, today, only one worker in five in the private sector is participating in a traditional pension, and a number of those, perhaps as many as a quarter, have been frozen in one respect e or another, meaning either no new benefits are accruing or new workers are not allowed into the plan. Um, if, you, if you isolate on, say, the, the 500 largest companies, or you know, the S&P or, or Fortune 500, you will still see a majority, roughly two-thirds, that offer a defined benefit pension. But it's still a minority that offer both a DB plan and a, a tax-favored savings plan, which um, federal employees uh, are able to participate in. Let me ask him, both of you. you have any idea of why there's sort of a common perception? I mean, when you talk to people, there seems to be a tendency to believe that the private sector does a better job in both these arenas than the public sector? I can't answer for sure why that perception might exist, but um, I, I, as one of the earlier witnesses said today, the, the difference in, in pay is very easy for people to measure. The difference in benefits is more complicated, um, particularly with younger workers uh, as the director of the TSP mentioned today, they have lower participation rates and lower contribution rates. They are going up, which is a good thing. But it's very difficult to get younger workers in particular to, to focus on the importance of saving for retirement or to understand the value of a defined benefit pension. Um, so I, th I think when, when people are comparing between the private sector and the public sector, they have a much clearer idea of about differences in pay than they do differences, particularly in retirement benefits. I can't really speak about uh, the health insurance aspect because that's not my area. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask about uh, the health insurance. Uh, well, I'm going to draw from some of my other experience in health insurance and say that many people in both the private and the public sector are concerned about health insurance coverage. And as employers, whether they're private sector employers, or other are reducing benefits, increasing co-insurance, increasing co-payments. Co so I'm not sure that this is a issue that is a concern only to federal employees' health benefit program, but it's also a issue of any employer-sponsored health benefit plan. Have you seen much movement in the vision dental coverage arena in terms of trends that might be evolving or developing? Um, in terms of trends, as I mentioned in my statement, that other private sector employers do have lower access than federal employees, rather, not employers, ha have ac a lower access. But what I cannot speak to is whether or not those employees have to pay 100% um, just like federal employees have to pay. Thank you. Thank you both very much. and. Uh, Mr. Marchant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Part-time employees have the same ability to access the health insurance. So if you're brought on at 20 hours, uh, you can, you have the same waiting period, you, and you can enter the program, and you have the, exactly the same access, no pre-existing 
everything is the same except the premium. Part-time employees will pay a larger share, and it's prorated based on the number of hours that they work. So that, but the access, it, it, it's available and they can get it. So there's a great amount of value in, as opposed to the corporate world now, uh, most corporations are moving to a part-time status so that they w are not required by law to offer insurance at any price. That's, that's correct. I in the Federal Employees uh, Health Benefits Program, employees are given the same access. As I said, they just have to pay a larger share of the premium, and they also are able to pay the premiums on a pre-tax basis, mm -hmm. just as the full-time workers are. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is a great, that is a great uh, uh, thing to be offered. And I think it probably, um, it's, it, it, you know, in the private world right now, in the corporate world, it's almost unheard of for a part-time worker to be able to even offer the, the plan. Uh, is there any document, Mr. Purcell, uh, that you know of that a federal worker is shown uh, when, they're, when they take their job that says, here is your cash compensation, and here is the value of uh, your benefits uh, package, it, it, its equivalency, so that there is some intelligent, uh, uh, so that a person can say, okay, if I go to work for this company and I'm paid this, or I go to work for the federal government and I'm paid this, same cash amount, is that meet made available? Or well, it, for, for new federal employees, they, w they would receive information as part of their orientation that will explain um, the pension benefit that's provided. The, the Thrift Board puts out numerous publications that are very easy to read. You know, they don't go into eight pages of fine print, but they have charts and that show you, you know, here's what you will accumulate if you start saving at this age or this age. So th I believe that the, the federal government is doing a pretty good job right now of informing new employees what retirement benefits they have available to them. How that is done in the private sector, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I would say that more companies in the private sector, about a quarter of the, say, Fortune 500, have gone to automatic enrollment in 401k plans, and I, uh, I think most observers expect that trend to continue. Um, and that's going to get a lot more people into 401k savings plans at an, at an earlier age, just as it would if it was adopted by the thrift plan. So the, the ability to uh, enter a defined benefit plan is a plus. The interesting thing is uh, in a defined benefit plan, the traditional pension, as a worker, you don't do anything. You, you're on the payroll, you're in the plan. You may not even be aware of it. That's one reason I was saying before it's, it's difficult for workers to compare retirement benefits because they're not quite sure of the value of those benefits. In a, um, in a defined contribution plan, since you're getting a sort of a quarterly statement of how much is in your account, it's much easier to see how you're doing. Um, the inertia in the past has been that newer workers and lower paid workers were reluctant to give up take-home pay to put money into the either the thrift plan for the government or the 401k plan uh, in the private sector. With automatic enrollment, y y the default is at six months or whatever the start date is, a certain percentage is going to be put into your account. Now, of course, you have to offer them the option to say, I don't want to do that. But studies, uh, real-world experiments in companies have shown once, once people are automatically enrolled, 90 percent, 95 percent of them stay in. Well, uh, just from a pure PR standpoint, the federal government, I don't think, does as good a job as they could do informing the potential employee out there that they can join uh, a company, uh, get automatic coverage on health care and their family at a, at a price, but get it, get in a A pension system that has a definable benefit uh, 
and then and then have a, a structure that surrounds it that is not contingent on a board of directors uh, annuitizing their pension plan and freezing them in it. It's one of those things where I think uh, the appreciation of the benefits that health and retirement benefits that federal employees receive often doesn't dawn on them until they've been in the federal government a number of years. I mean, I talk to a lot of federal employees about retirement issues, and many of them are not aware at all that they are covered by a traditional pension in addition to the thrift savings plan. And the one thing that, that, that I don't know, Mr. Chairman, if this dogs you or not, but I, I turn on sometimes on Sunday afternoon, I'm driving back from my ranch back home, getting ready to come back up here and I listen to these financial gurus, you know, and they harp on the fact that I don't pay any Social Security tax. And then I get these chain emails. Was there ever a time that, that we did not pay Social Security tax? And where does that come from? <laughs> a long time ago. Prior to 1984, members of Congress, like every other federal employee, were in the civil service retirement system, and that system was actually created before Social Security. Okay. When the 1983 Social Security amendments were passed, par part of those amendments said, from now on, all new employees are going to be in Social Security, and all members of Congress will be in Social Security. All, social, all uh, members of Congress pay Social Security taxes. I've seen the email. I've seen it many, many times. <laughs> and we do have a report about retirement benefits for members of Congress that explains very clearly that they pay the same Social Security taxes as every other citizen of the United States, except, of course, there are some state workers who don't. Right. In Texas, right. I think, is one of them. Yes, it is, and they want to double dip. But uh, thanks for your information. I appreciate your testimony. And that the retirement is not nearly as lucrative. It, it's it's probably not going to be the many millions of dollars that the email <laughs> says. Well, you know, the public has this perception <laughs> that it's just a fat cat yeah. pension that you get. I do a television show every week, and I've got some callers who just call in. They want to yeah. know, what are you going to do with your pension? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm saying, my wife would probably like to know. <laughs> what I'm going to get <laughs> as a pension. Let me, I've just got one additional uh, question, Mr. Purcell. What is the average age at which federal employees retire, and what's uh, their average monthly pension? The average age uh, has been very stable for, for many years, uh, uh, right around 61. And currently, the retirees under the civil service retirement system get an average pension of about 20. 500 a month, which would work out to 30,000 a year. And under the FERS, the average pension is about 900. Now, the reason that number is so much lower, th th there are two reasons. One is the, f the FERS pension is smaller because those workers are also covered by Social Security. So their combined benefit is bigger. And secondly, the retirees under CSRS um, still have a, a higher average career length FERS is still, as a pension system, fairly young, so the FERS retirees don't have as long a career um, as the CSRS retirees. Well, thank you very much, and I think that's about what the average member of Congress who retired <laughs> <laughs> get. <laughs> and I understand it's about $35,000 a year. Um, <laughs> let me thank you all very much for your patience and, and your diligence. We really appreciate you're very welcome. You stayed, and uh, Mr. Martin, unless you've got some additional questions, comments, um, we thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned. And we thank our staff who've also done diligence and got a lot of late evening work.